इधर फ्रोजन नहीं यहाँ पे तो ठीक है सिंधु इज देर हाय एवरीवन हेलो हेलो एवरीवन हाय हाय विनीता या डीपली it's an important issue it needs to be discussed and talked about and we, that's what we believe and we have gathered here today to do just that uh, we have with us today some very eminent researchers on the subject along with our down to earth team uh, which has worked on the story uh, i would like to take us into the discussions without much ado but before that just a small pointer uh, please put down your questions comments suggestions etc in the chat or the q and a box and uh, time permitting uh this is a one hour webinar we will respond right here in case we can't uh we will get back uh, that is a promise uh let me begin with richard mahapatra richard richard is the managing editor of down to earth and we have requested him to just give us a very very brief two minute overview of the issue as the magazine has portrayed richard over to you please thank you soparna welcome everybody this particular webinar is about an issue that's very fundamental to the natural world that's coexistence and is the most fundamental principle of the natural world but uh, today and this story is all about a part of the world that's not i think to some extent not that natural by its settings inhabitants by its diversity and uh, that's the urban world and in this urban world we are also talking about you know the our co-sellers the dogs monkeys and pigeons they have been with us since ages as far as the human history goes back and we can find them around us but in the urban world of late in the urban areas of india of late we see a conflict brewing and again raising this very fundamental question the natural questions of coexistence in a natural world and that question is being raised now in context of the urban india and this three species that we share our space with and it not just a simple coexistence issue it's turning out to be a almost a race to a conflict situations starting from politicians to parliament to judiciary uh, to activists to journalists like us we have been actually tracking this is so because there are incidences and it's turning out to be a public health issue it's turning out to be a, you know a physical issue per se so how to deal with this and this story is about basically looking at this uh, natural coexistence issue in the urban world and particularly this three that species that we are facing currently Mm, a conflict with if i can say that so the story actually goes into the details of it and uh, as you have seen in recent there is public debates over it also whether we can get in how to actually establish that coexistence a peaceful coexistence where everybody shares their space with the other peacefully or we should give that how to give that space also similarly the second question is it a human behavior 
is to is to be made responsible for this situation or something else so this cover story and the webinar is all about that and we are talking in context of the urban india over to you sapanno thank you sir uh, that was very uh, well put brief and succinct uh, i would now request himanshu um, who was part of the down to earth team which was working on this story himanshu and uh, rajat ghai both of them are here Uh, himanshu will take uh, charge of the first part of the presentation that we have to make on for you know uh, down to earth himanshu yeah hi suparno uh, thank you and uh, hi everyone um, so uh, as uh, richard uh, suggested uh, we have uh, identified uh, three uh, animals uh, per se monkey dog and uh, pigeon and uh, with respect to urban context you know how uh, this has uh, how this uh, animals always lived with us uh, together but then like in recent years uh, there has been a growing conflict and uh, so uh, just to uh, bring you to numbers uh, very quickly so uh, in the pa- in uh, last year 2022 there have been like 1.92 million dog bites that have been registered uh, with an average of 5200 incidents a day uh, which is like uh, close to uh, uh, 216 dog bites in an hour and uh, the dog bites amount to 96% of the rabies cases in india which uh, we think is a, a big number and and uh, issue that uh, should be spoken about uh the second uh, thing is about monkeys uh, which is also uh, like about 1000 cases of bites a day in city uh, in a day in cities and it is also responsible for spread of rabies and other zoonotic diseases <clears throat> and third is pigeons pigeons have been um, uh we we all see a uh, lot of pigeons being fed or you know around uh, uh, the roofs and uh, metro stations everywhere and uh, this droppings uh, that are commonly seen across the cities uh, that can lead to lung infections and hypersensitivity uh, pneumotinosis and uh, cryptococcal uh, meningitis and cystitis so uh, uh, looking at that uh, we try to analyze how uh, these three animals the, the population uh, how it grew and how, what led to this crisis that you know there's been uh, such extreme uh, situation where there are one on one side there are people who uh, have been uh, taking care of it uh, of these animals feeding them and on the um, and on the other side there are people who uh, just do not want them uh, or they want them out of their residential societies so starting with dogs uh, uh, in uh, Uh, so apart from this 2022 uh, 1.92 million dog bite cases last year the situation was not uh, uh, different before uh, pre pandemic in 2019 also 7.8 million dog bites cases were registered which is close to 2000 cases a day and uh, india uh, by far leads uh, uh, rabies uh, in, in terms of rabies cases spread by dogs which amounts to like 1.3 uh, sorry uh, one third of the total cases and which has become an increasing uh, public safety concern all across india we keep re- uh, reading media reports about how uh, young children uh, 10 11 year old uh, kids who were being attacked by uh, dogs pack of dogs or mauled to death and even uh, uh, speaking of, uh, regarding the story when we were working what we spoke to so many people who said even elderly who feel scared to venture out for even evening walks and also there are like families who uh, want to go out for late evening walks or go to the market or emergency uh, cases uh, at night and uh, they have been like hunted or uh, followed by dogs you know scaring them so uh, this so we uh, decided that you know uh, how we should uh, analyze the situation and how we should go about it uh, so uh, we say that so many 
cases have been uh, registered, but the, these cases attribute because uh, there have been increasing uh, number of doubts in each locality in, in cities and uh, in every state. It's not limited to just uh, one particular area, geographic area, it's all over India. Uh, but uh, there have been like measures that have been taken by the government uh, regarding animal birth, birth control, which is uh, popularly known as ABC rules. And it's not uh, uh, very recent. We have been working on our uh, population controls since the 90s, early 90s or mid 90s. Uh, where Chennai and Jaipur became the first cities to start a sustained uh, uh, ABC control program or anti rabies program, uh, which uh, later on evolved uh, over the years. And in 2000, uh, when the center released ABC rule guidelines to sterilize dogs. So before that, India used to uh, euthanize dogs or identify uh, violent or rabid dogs and euthanize them. But uh, that process came to an end, and um, eventually uh, we started sterilizing dogs. And uh, India, uh, in 2007, started identifying rabies as a priority zoonotic disease. Uh, in 2008, Tamil Nadu became the first state in India to implement a statewide multisectoral rabies control initiative. Uh, and uh, after 2008, until 2011, there were like five uh, cities which uh, expanded these programs. Uh, program for rabies control, but uh, there were like two uh, developments in between, uh, where in 2009, uh, Animal Welfare Board of India released uh, standard operating procedures for ABC programs, and in 2010, uh, there were amendments. Uh, so after uh, its success or after effective implementation, the central government decided to expand the rabies project uh, across India. And in 2012, uh, during the 5th year plan, um, it was uh, spread, uh, it was implemented across India. Uh, in 2021, India launched a national action plan for dog mediated rabies elimination, uh, which is also, uh, which was with National Contagious Disease uh, Center, sorry, NCDC and uh, other uh, uh, initiatives taken by the government. And in 2023, India, uh, in March recently, India uh, amended ABC rules uh, in which it identifies dog, uh, dogs as community dogs and uh, holds uh, resident welfare associations or you know people living around uh, to sterilize and vaccinate them. Uh, so this is how the journey has been so far. And uh, we have come far from uh, euthanizing dogs to government actually asking to take care of it, uh, of them and feeding them. Uh, but the animal birth control essentially, uh, fundamentally uh, say uh, to capture these dogs from where they live in those local localities, sterilize them and return them uh, where, from where they were captured. Uh, but in this case, uh, the rules also suggest that the dogs with rabies cannot be euthanized. So if in case there's a rabbit dog, uh, you cannot, uh, euthanize it, but uh, it will have to, uh, it lead to a natural death, uh, which is like almost a week to 10 days, uh, but uh, which is contested that back then is that it is quite painful, uh, but uh, that is how the law says. Uh, also uh, speaking to experts, uh, they said that uh, the uh, one concern as uh, Richard said that is it also our human behavior that uh, is causing this uh, problem. Uh, maybe because some experts that we spoke to, they said that in dogs, we have 19% natural survival rate. So if if we lead, uh, leave dogs up to it, there will be very few pups who will grow to grow as adults. But uh, uh, feeding them, taking care of these pups uh, have also encouraged or increased their survival rate and uh, help the population grow. So even if after uh, implementation of animal birth control, uh, it's becoming difficult to control the dog population because the survival rates have also jumped. Also, uh, the ABC uh, implementation is done by NGOs and local hospitals, private hospitals, uh, and is monitored by local government bodies. Uh, but uh, studies have also shown that uh, uh, these centers are uh, most of the time not functioning, they're profit driven. Uh, they have poor and unhygienic conditions for dogs and also uh, floating norms. Uh, so 
this overall situation has uh, created a conflict situation between the residential welfare societies who want strict rules or uh, uh, you know uh, laws that can keep the dogs away. Uh, but there are also dog lovers who are conflicting it or conflicting it or contesting, saying that you know dogs should be kept close uh, as has been in the past and should be fed and taken care of. So these conflicts have also uh, gone to court where the judiciary has um, repeatedly in multiple cases uh, uh, suggested that you know dogs should be taken care of or fed um, and have gone uh, totally against uh, euthanizing uh, even when uh, people have uh, approached or requested court for it. So uh, this, this uh, question, this big question still remains that uh, should we euthanize dogs or isolate them uh, and uh, where should we go uh, from this? Uh, so this is uh, from me uh, about dogs, and I think now Rajat will uh, take care about uh, the monkey and uh, pigeon from here. Thank you. Right. Very much. Thank you, Himanshu. Thank you so much. Uh, you have built the base on which we can further discuss, and we have some eminent people here, researchers who uh, can contribute to that. Uh, I will now request Rajat Ghai, uh, our second uh, very seasoned uh, reporter, to come in and. Uh, give his, uh, you know, uh, presentation. Uh, Rajat is going to focus on uh, the entire issue with monkeys and pigeons. Rajat, please take the stand. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. So um, I'll be talking about uh, monkeys and pigeons. So, um, well, uh, there are, um, we are all primates, well, we are all uh, primates, humans are primates, there are other primates as well, including, uh, well, uh, macaques, bonobos, great apes, lesser apes, but here I'm going to focus mostly on macaques, and among macaques, I'm going to focus on uh, this guy, the rhesus macaque, and he has several species of macaques, uh, there is uh, the bonnet macaque uh, south of the Kaveri. There is the uh, Arunachal macaque in uh, the northeast. Uh, this guy is found over most of India uh, from the Himalayan foothills till uh, the Godavari and uh, uh, the Tapti rivers. Uh, why uh, this, this uh, the recess is the most, uh, has the most wide range of any non human primate. And perhaps that is a that is the main problem because it shares spaces with humans in South, Central, and Southeast Asia a huge range. And uh, well, uh, to add a bit of trivia, the rhesus is named after a king mentioned in the Greek Iliad. But there is nothing remotely related to antiquity about the human rhesus conflict. It is a conflict very much of today's India, and uh, uh, it plays out in both rural and urban India. But here I'm going to talk only about urban India. Uh, so uh, why uh, 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 we are uh, why are we focusing on urban areas? Uh, basically, we are to blame for this. We cut the forests where uh, these rhesus macaques live. They are then uh, uh, forced to relocate to villages and to cities, there they come across uh, a ready supply of food, which is a game changer of sorts. Uh, why? Because uh, our urban uh, uh, waste uh, uh, management is in doldrums. People like to waste food. All that uh, it becomes a steady supply of food to these macaques. This changes their biology, their social behavior, uh, uh, I mean, once they have a steady supply of food, uh, uh, they can they know that they can pr uh, produce more offspring, which will survive into adulthood. Uh, that and rhesus macaques, like their cousins, the bonobo, the chimpanzee, the colobids, or uh, uh, other primates, are quite promiscuous. So they procreate 
and uh, moreover they lose the when we feed in india we all know the recess is considered to be the earthly incarnation of uh, hanuman the deity hanuman and uh, uh, when um, people tend to feed them a lot as you can see in this picture uh, when we feed them voluntarily offer them food voluntarily they also lose their natural fear of man they also don't want to go back to their natural habitat they want to stay in human dominated areas uh, what uh, does this uh, what effect does this have uh, basically uh, the monkeys are carriers of rabies and kasinoor forest disease today is uh, world zoonosis day we have just been through a pandemic which had perpetrated zoonotic origins uh, uh, there is a study out by the university of queensland earlier this week which says that the increasing population of monkeys macaques and wild boar uh, will lead to more zoonotic diseases uh, in the future so it's a very scary scenario and uh, uh, people also uh, there is also economic damage these monkeys cause damage to property of course they cause damage to crops in rural areas in urban areas they cause damage to property uh, let me also say here that uh, the delhi high court banned uh, feeding of monkeys in 2007 macaques rhesus macaques uh, but i am sitting in uh, uh, down towards uh, tuglakabad office uh, the tuglakabad fort is quite nearby every day i go to work i see people feeding monkeys wantonly there is no awareness about what this what impact this will have on them this will in turn rebound on them uh, we also have the had the very sorry uh, very tragic instance of uh, ss bajwa the deputy mayor of uh, delhi who died in 2007 while staving off uh, uh, rampaging macaques from his terrace so uh, all uh, uh, all this is causing uh, lots of headaches for uh, cities in india especially in northern india like cities like delhi and uh, uh, agra which have been noted noteworthy in this regard indian states have uh, tried n number of methods including relocation sterilization and all that uh, is mentioned there on the slide but none of them seems to work because of myriad reasons i uh, i i believe uh, one of our panelists ms radha krishna will talk about change uh, some possible solutions to this problem but it, for the moment it is an intractable problem and uh, the future seems scary uh, as far as rhesus macaques are concerned um next i'll take you to pigeons pigeons are a new entrant to uh uh the uh, list of animals that have uh, become almost unmanageable of late uh, and why is that again we are to blame for that we humans because we feed them uh, and pigeons are like rhesus macaques they are also very adaptable to urban conditions they are ledge nesters uh, you see uh, pigeons are basically all feral or all, all pigeons we see today in india cities are descendants of the rock dove or the or columbus livia and the rock dove originally uh, used to uh, inhabit rocky ledges uh, but when they came to cities uh, uh, they any rock any overhang is enough for them they have generalist diets they can nest throughout the year and there are no predators in cities i mean nadeem shahzad one of the two brothers who was featured in that documentary that was nominated to the oscars told me that the only big raptor in urban india is the black kind and the black kind does not hunt much it's more of a scavenger so the pigeon does not have uh, any uh, uh, natural predators in cities feeding we of course feed them a lot now uh, uh, turning to uh, why pigeons and uh, are a public health hazard pigeons are known to spread zoonosis through their feathers and droppings uh, during the course of reporting on this story i uh, profiled a lady called uh, in kandivali west in bombay 
who developed hypersensitivity pneumonitis tests and she is now for life she will be on steroids or immunosuppressants because her lungs are entirely damaged and she did not even feed pigeons uh, but as uh, one of our panelists mr fayaz put sir told me uh, uh, pigeon feathers and pigeon droppings which are of course very acidic in nature are everywhere in our environment in cities you will find them in the soil in uh, you will find them suspended in uh, the air and with an air quality like delhi's you can well imagine uh, all that making its way to your into your lungs there are other uh, diseases as well cryptococcal meningitis cytokosis uh, are two that come to mind uh, uh, the magnitude of the problem is such that the pune municipal corporation in 2023 this uh, in march this year termed the uh, pigeons and their population explosion as a health hazard um so uh ane has also declared pune and thane municipal corporations are declared a fine of rupees 500 on pigeon feeders but i don't think that seems to deter anybody i mean i was uh, i went with a colleague of mine nidun vijayan to a traffic island near chitranjan park a few days back in the morning and there were people galore feeding heaps of grain to pigeons without any thought about what it will uh, what impact it will have uh, as you can also see the bombay high court in 2016 ruled that pigeon feeding should not be a should pigeon feeding should i am sorry for that should be uh, should not be a nuisance to others uh, in march 2019 the supreme court upheld the order so there you would have it that pigeons and macaques basically have become problems for us because of our mostly because of our own doing uh, we are solely to blame if uh, not entirely uh, for what has happened uh, for possible solutions i hope our panelists today can have offer some possible solutions but for now i end my presentation thank you raja uh, let me uh, now request uh, dr abi uh, tamim banak uh, senior fellow uh, at atri in uh, bangalore uh, dr banak hi how are you we are meeting oh. again after some time yes uh, so hi uh, nice Banak, nice to meet you uh, yeah. yes same sir uh, we uh, what we are looking for from you is uh, uh, you know short a brief introduction to the public health perspective in terms of you know you you have done extensive work with uh, dogs and on rabies uh, and basically the time i am sorry but the time that we have is about 5 to 7 minutes so i am i am planning to give about 5 to 7 minutes to all the panelists thank you sir can please go ahead okay thank you um i'm going to um jump right in i'll share my screen right. and um, is the screen visible Yes, yes, it is. Yeah, and yes. the presentation is moving. Yes. Okay. So, um, you know, I'm going to talk about uh, talk about the public health problem of having, uh, in in this case, especially for dogs. But Rajat has um, has touched upon the problem with uh, with macaques and uh, and with pigeons as well. But but let's just just quickly move on to dogs. Um, India is known as the rabies capital of the world. Um, we have an estimated twenty thousand human deaths due to rabies. every year uh, some uh, some experts suggest that this might be an underestimate okay uh, this this data is old but but the patterns are unlikely to have changed and uh, we have probably more now uh, dog bite cases per year uh, in around 2005 2006 it was estimated there are about 20 million dog bite cases a year but with the human population increase and um, dog population increase that Uh, that figure is likely to go on, have gone up uh, significantly um when you think of a rabid dog most of you think of this kind of an animal you know very aggressive biting um but but that's not the only kind of rabid dogs you'll see um there might be others that are you know very harmless looking like this little playful puppy um who you know who just wants to play with you um or it could look very sick like this animal who's clearly in a lot of distress uh, but clearly it also not aggressive okay 
Um, it could look like a disoriented dog on the street. And you aren't sure what it wants to And you can see, in fact, this one's trying to go towards water, uh, but it, it won't be successful. Um, it could even be a pet dog that has not been vaccinated, such as this black lab Labrador. Um, now, these all these animals tested positive for rabies as part of a survey that we were doing. Okay. And I want to show you some very alarming facts. Why is India the rabies capital? Well, I'm going to show you the data from where, where it comes from. This is from my own research and that along with another group of uh, group that I was working with. So um, we did one health surveillance uh, in Pune city. Uh, we worked with the, the Rescue Charitable Trust. These are amazing people who do fantastic work um, on animal welfare and, uh, and they run a really excellent facility. I, uh, I would suggest this is one of the best animal welfare organizations in the country. Um, so we partnered with them um, to collect data on suspected rabies, uh, rabid dogs across Pune city. Um, and so they would, you know, they regularly conduct vaccination camps and they regularly go and uh, interact with community members and so on. Um, and they have uh, ambulances and people throughout the city for collecting uh, any suspected animal um, or any wounded animal or anything, any animal that's in distress. Um, so animals that died, we tested them for rabies. And I, I note in the comments that people are saying, can we test for rabies while the animal is still alive? You can't. Uh, those tests are not reliable. You have to get a brain sample post-mortem to, to do this test. Okay. And uh, it's a simple test, but even this is not 100% confirmatory. There, there is an under uh, estimation of rabies with this test as well. So you need to do a confirmatory um, RNA test. Okay. But this is what the data look like. This is just one year's data. Every red dog represents a rabies case, and this is in Pune City. Okay. So let's see how that one year played out. As you can see, there's a very alarming number of rabies cases coming in from Pune. Now, we've continued to do this survey over the next few years. And um, this is what all the rabies cases just in Pune City look like over from 2017, late 2017 to uh, early 2021, uh, including the COVID years. Uh, COVID years, of course, uh, there was a dip because there were fewer people out on the streets. Um, and, you know, there was some sort of, um, there was some sort of seasonality to the to, to the way numbers were, were coming in or were being reported, but not much, not that different. And year to year, uh, there was not too much difference in the number of cases that were testing positive, okay? So let me give you a summary of what we found. We, um, we tested about uh, uh, 1,200 suspe you know, suspected cases of which more, more than 750 cases were positive. Okay, that's an alarming number of positive cases for rabies. This is now one of the largest data sets for rabies cases in any place across the world. Okay. Again, alarmingly, more than 80, uh, at least 80 neutered dogs uh, tested positive for, for rabies, which suggests that the one-time vaccination that's been done is not sufficient. Uh, pet dogs were testing positive, which means that pet owners were not, uh, were not keeping up with vaccination, uh, vaccination of these animals. And at least, and this is a minimum number, yeah, because because note that this is all of this. There's a lot of underreporting also that goes on, and we had at least four percent of dogs with the history of biting people or animals. And we went out and we traced all of those people, and and uh, Neha and her team at rescue went and made sure that people were made aware about the dangers of rabies. Uh, post exposure profile access was given to them, and this then limited the number of human rabies cases in Pune in those years, I think almost zero human rabies cases in Pune, despite such a huge number of canine rabies cases in, in the city. So this data set actually is a testimony to the fact that uh, our, current, um, our current methods of controlling rabies are failing. The ABC program is a failure when it comes to controlling rabies. Now, ABC program has been running in Pune for a long period of time. It hasn't been, and just like it's, it's not, it's a faulty policy. It's not designed to succeed because there are no success parameters around ABC. It's a very vague policy. And it's the only, I mean, think about rabies is the only disease 
where the health ministry is not in charge of controlling the disease and controlling the vector, it's given over to a different ministry. Uh, the Animal Welfare Board of India has been shuttling around for the past 20 years, you know, from environment ministry to statistics to culture to, and now sitting in the animal husbandry department. Again, none of these ministries are nodal agencies for, for a disease, a zoonotic disease, um, which kills so many people annually. So, uh, you know, one of the speakers mentioned about the National Action Plan for rabies elimination. That is now product of what the NCDC has brought out, but still there's no communication between them and, uh, and the scientific consensus on how to control rabies. Everyone's talking about mass vaccination, but mass vaccination cannot happen where you have 60 to 80 million street, uh, you know, free ranging dogs in the streets. So rabies is not gonna go away anytime soon. Um, other than rabies, we also have diseases that are carried by dogs, including a lot of um, parasites, uh, endoparasites, such as worms, uh, dog feces and urine are classified as an environmental hazard by, um, by, by, the, uh, by the US uh, USDA, the, the, the US government. And think of, you've got like 70, 80 million dogs roaming our streets, pooping all over the place. Um, that's going into our surface water, that's contaminating our water. There's a lot of disease risks here. So um, it's not just about rabies, it's about a whole other host of diseases, including diseases of, um, that are a problem for wildlife. So I'll stop here and uh, maybe we'll have time for questions. So we'll, uh, we'll take that up later. Yeah. Right. Thank you, Dr. Varna. Thank you so much. Um, um, if I can just jump in, there, was, there were some questions uh, at the beginning. Uh, about uh, the sources of, uh, you know, the numbers that we have. Uh, Himanshu uh, and Rajat, uh, if I can address that to you. Uh, there were a few questions on the sources of numbers of the bites. Uh, you know, how do we, how, from where do we access that? Before I get on to Fayaz and uh, the rest of the speakers that we have here. Himanshu, would you like to comment on that? You're on mute. Yes. 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 yes, yes. yes. No, you are on eco. Something else is on. Better. Yeah, better. So, uh, data we have sourced from uh, uh, government, uh, so the websites and online, and also uh, the number of dog case, uh, bite cases. I think it's uh, about 2019 and uh, even 2022. I think they have come from. Uh, uh, Parliamentary question that was asked in the Lok Sabha. So that is how. Okay. It's mainly right. 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 Yes, Dr. Banak. Yes, Dr. Um, the dog bite cases data is actually very poorly assembled um, and mostly collected from uh, what's it's called the, um, you know, there's the IDSP portal which collects data on dog bite cases. Um, and that's under reporting because only government hospitals report it, private clinics don't. So that's a massive underreporting. Um, so it's a, a multi multi centric survey, which the APCRI has done now. We're waiting for the results of the new one to come out. Hopefully next week it'll come. Um, but yeah, so those those numbers are vastly underreported. Uh, so right. that's a, you know low balling thank of you. the number of dog bite cases. Okay, thank you. Uh, I can see that uh, Sunita ji is also uh, on screen with us. Uh, would you like to say something, Sunita ji, at this moment, or can I go on to the next speaker? Okay. Uh, I don't think she's... So, uh, can I ask now uh, Mr. Payaz Kudsar, uh, who's a wildlife ecologist, to step in? And uh, from Mr. Kudsar, we would like to uh, basically understand uh, this entire issue of pigeons and the new relationship that has emerged between uh, us city dwellers and pigeons. Mr. Uh, Fayyaz, I believe you uh, have also some commitments and you wanted to leave a little early. So I thought I'll bring it to you first. Hello, thank you. I, uh, am I audible? Yes, yes. Please go if ahead. you see, talk about any metro city, the moment you reach in the city, the two birds are very prominent. One is black kite and second is feral pigeons. And uh, uh, unfortunately, in a human altered uh, ecosystem, things are much more complicated. It is not only pigeon itself, 
when you see that uh, in a recent past when we went through covid it clearly suggested that when you simplified the ecosystem these zoonotic or zoonosis or zoonotic diseases become much more you know rampant because simplified ecosystem has no capacity to what you call dilute these uh, pathogens uh, pathogens within it and therefore they spill over and cause a lot of create a lot of problem so when you look at uh, urban center where uh, everything is altered and modified human modified where not only birds but plants are also behaving differently for example when you look at delhi uh, itself which is uh, about 7777 uh, hectares of area designated as delhi ridge when you, you you go closer to the ridge you will find that single species which is dominating that is prosopis juliflora or vilaiti kicker so now come down to the what do you call feral pigeon in fact which has very close relationship with the human beings especially in urban centers because most of the people especially in urban center they try to go closer to the environment and the easiest way they find go going closer to the environment is feeding pigeons they feed pigeons they see that they are doing something great for the nature and that is the way they trying they try contributing not only that there are many mythological there are many myth and there are many suggestions which says that easily you can put a ladder on heaven by feeding pigeons easily you can reach to heaven so these things um, over a period of time made us in a way we are highly a person with a very good heart we indians we think that giving food creates a lot of ease for the animals and birds <clears throat> but while studying in wilderness area especially i worked in central india and kuno and other places for longer period of time and i've seen here in year 2002 when there was a serious drought uh, in chambal region many birds which kept giving 2x or 4x they have given 2x or no x nest was built up x was not incubated we were not aware what is happening about eight nest i monitored suddenly i realized that after a month there was no rain birds were aware that there will be no rain no seeds no grasses so what young one will eat so no incubation no chicks came out so what it says it says that until unless you have food security these wild bird and animal they never breed similarly in puno initially when i went there to do some baseline study i find that there were 24 villages within the uh, what do you call uh, uh, kuno and slowly which were relocated and rehabilitated outside in one year there was six time increment in cheetal population and when people were around the kuno river was full of cattle the what do you call grassland were occupied by cattle and human beings and therefore when suddenly when they were relocated and rehabilitated outside in one year i found that cheetal population gone very high and all these indications suggest that until unless you give food security any population including pigeons cannot grow and pigeon is not only indian problem but across the globe this become a huge issue and it is not a simple problem when you see it has health hazard serious health hazard everybody knows and recently some of the publication said that it has it has fire risk in uh, Uh, high rise buildings when it brings a lot of twigs and kept put piling those twigs uh, on the windows and acs and all those and when there's a fire it may further accelerate fire so the most important ecological problem which i found in urban center that pigeons are being generally feeder they are competing with very specialized feeder for example if you see that how common men are interacting with pigeon differently only bank mana and what you call pigeons go very close i see in delhi but you cannot find or rarely find that pigeons and sparrows are feeding together so these indicator clearly suggesting that growing pigeon population are not only health hazard but a serious problem altering the trophic cascade of any ecosystem which is providing you ecological goods and services because ultimately you know Uh, effect goes in a different direction for which uh, uh, what do you call affect the air and water and so therefore uh, in my opinion i i see that uh, uh, some of the data suggest that an individual pigeon can defecate about 
10 to 12 kg per year. And now you can understand if you have so many pigeons in your city and in your surrounding areas, then you can understand what are the uh, amount of uh, what do you call defecation or droppings are deposited on, on your surrounding areas. And when they dry and they become airborne, they become serious threat for many respiratory diseases and many other diseases. So solution finding solution is not easy because uh, quickly one can say that a stop feeding and alone feeding, a stopping feeding might not be affecting pigeon a lot because pigeon has capacity to fly uh, away and going far away to get food uh, from different places. But the visual observation and uh, other, what do you call, uh, uh, data suggesting that probably a stopping feeding might be affecting pigeon in certain period of time. It is not quick. But I think in five to seven years, certainly we could see some remarkable changes. But altering that practice, what human beings are doing, especially in Delhi, a city like Delhi, where we have thousands of feeding centers, and religiously we go every day, purchase food, uh, uh, seeds, and throw before the pigeons. And they are uh, wherever you see pigeons are eating, you have plenty of rats also, and they are caving in in your roads and. For God's sake, if some disease comes and appears, which we know, uh, uh, you know, historic pandemic uh, of uh, diseases, which uh, impacts rat and ultimately reaches to city, if such thing happen, then probably it will create havoc in urban center. So pigeon is not alone a species, but it has a lot of consequences on other bird species and rat population, which also has. Uh, association with other foraging guild. So many things we need to do as far as pigeon is concerned, knowing the fact that it is very common to see everywhere. Nobody is doing any heat. Nobody is studying it. It is very urgent need to study it carefully to see its wider, what do you call, ecological role, consequences, and impact in neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Good, sir. That was brilliant report. Thank you so much. Uh, can I now uh, jump to uh, uh, Sindhu Radha Krishna, uh, School of uh, Natural Sciences and Engineering? That's where she's from, Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore. Uh, we would request uh, Sindhu to uh, look at monkeys and the issue of numbers and essentially from a solutions perspective. Sir. Thank you very much, Parno. Am I audible? Yes, absolutely. My thanks to uh, Down to Earth for arranging this uh, as we had begun. Speaking about is a very critical and current issue for all of us. And I think greater awareness about this is really required. Um, as we had mentioned, you know, in terms of coexistence, what we're looking for is solutions, what can, what can be achieved to move towards coexistence. As uh, Rajat and uh, the article had also uh, summarized, a number of solutions have already been tried to reduce human macaque conflict. Uh, these have been long standing. And they're still currently being used in various measures by several government institutions. Uh, we don't see this as being successful because we seem to expect a single magic day when there are no more conflicts or all interactions are very peaceful. This, quite frankly, is unlikely to occur. Uh, macaques have been interacting with humans. They have you know, been in close association. Some macaques have been in close association with human settlements for many, many years. Uh, this is part of their biology and the behavior. Human settlements offer them uh, good access to food, safety from predators, and some macaques actually thrive, the reasons in particular, in association with human settlements. Um, but unfortunately, uh, over the past few decades, uh, these interactions have turned quite unpleasant and negative. Number of reasons for this. And uh, one of the bigger reasons has been proposed to be the increase in macaque numbers. Also, the fact that there have been more macaque populations moving towards human spaces rather than just being within the forest as we expect them to be. Um, it's important to understand that we hold a great deal of responsibility for this. Um, as the articles on both uh, dogs, pigeons, and macaques mention, the availability of food that we provide is a big attractant. 
uh, not only do humans provision macaques voluntarily, you know, just like pigeons, we like to feed monkeys because of our cultural and religious reasons. We also provision them involuntarily because of our extremely unhealthy and unclean hygiene practices, basically garbage disposal. Um, so even, you know, studies we had done to try and understand why conflict perpetuates or escalates, uh, saw that, you know, when people started uh, dropping off garbage near forest edges, that attracted monkeys to come out, feed on them, and then start moving towards human settlements. So we are responsible you know, in a great way by offering this attractant and also trying to modify the behavior, although we may not be aware of it. And here lies, I think, a very important solution. We need to change our behavior. We can't stick to the same old behavior that we have always practiced. I think we are rather proud of our culture, of being a nation that coexists with a lot of species. And justifiably, we have, you know, Despite all the negatives, we have a lot of positives also. But I think it's time we try to understand that we need to modify our behavior also. We need to keep our surroundings more clear. We need to manage our garbage better. We need to stop providing rich human food to wildlife, which is not really necessary for them. We need to control these practices ourselves. Instead of doing this, we are always looking for a third solution, sterilization, translocation, population management. While all of these are necessary, I think we also need to pay equal attention to our own behavior modification. And this is something that can be put in place. In fact, there is a measure in place, ban and provisioning. However, in practice, it's not really carried out. I don't think there is a single solution. I think we need to work on multiple solutions. And some of these solutions are very specific to the areas. For example, solutions that are going to work or a crop trading area landscape will not work in the urban. And we need to be aware of that. In the urban scenario, we need to have better managed garbage management. We need to have our houses more securitized. We need to be aware of the fact that these are sources of food that's going to be attractive to monkeys and therefore we need to keep our work. Other countries have dealt with it. This is not a unique problem to India. We need to learn how to do this. Two, we also need to stop looking for one A solution that somebody will provide and somebody will do. And that is the crux of the problem. Forever there is this, you know, uh, this pushing of responsibility onto somebody else. When it's a wild monkey, it's the forest department's problem. They must deal with it. We won't stop provisioning. The general public won't stop provisioning because we like to be compassionate. But somehow the forest department must deal with the fallouts of it. They must come take away these monkeys if they are disturbing us. They must translocate them. They must sterilize them. They must do everything. It's always somebody else's problem. And I think we excel at this. And this is again something that we need to change ourselves. We need to understand that this is something that we as a community would require. We would like to be known as a compassionate community. And then we should work towards it. We can't keep pushing these responsibilities onto some everybody else's problems. We need to work together as a community for it. Coexistence will not happen without cooperation. And this cooperation is not only cooperation with the species, it is also with other human groups and communities. We need to work together to create a community that is peaceful and actually talks about coexistence. Even when it comes to dogs, there's always constantly pet dogs versus community dogs, RWA versus others. There's always this versus us. I think we need to change that. We need to educate ourselves what does provisioning or this, you know, this giving of human food to animals, what does it really mean? What are the consequences? Why do we need to stop it? We need to put those measures. They are fairly simple measures. In fact, I think they're much more simpler than putting large scale culling efforts or sterilization efforts. I'm not saying they should not be done. I think they should all work together in tandem. Somehow we always give more importance for monkey conflict towards sterilization efforts or culling efforts rather than doing simple measures more strongly like banning provisioning, actually working out in practice, educating people better. Because these are not very, you know, I don't know how to put it, not very smart solutions perhaps. So people don't pay a lot of attention to them. How I think that is really the solution. We need to work on multiple solutions together and we need to work on changing our behavior first before we go around deciding, oh, that monkey population problem, let's reduce these numbers. This monkey population problem, let's reduce these. While all of these measures need to be done, we also need to focus around 
themselves. And that I think is what I would like to. Thank you very much. I'll stop there and we can take more questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sindhu. Uh, let me, uh, we will take some, a few questions, but let me first then, uh, you know, go to, before that, go to Vinita, uh, uh, Vinita Srinandan. She is the chairperson of Seawoods Estate Limited. It's a NRI complex in Navi, Mumbai. Uh, Vinita, uh, can you come on, please? And I would request you, uh, basically, you are the public voice of what is happening today. And just, you know, you have also been involved in uh, sort of legally fighting certain cases on this issue. So just share your experiences. And I think you have a presentation, Vinita. No, uh, no presentation. I'll just be speaking okay. about my experience. Right. Right, yeah. please, on to you. Uh, thank you to down for down to down to earth for giving me this opportunity, and uh, and thanks to the other panels who have spoken really very well, and I agree with them and their views. And uh, it's we are here today to discuss the urban menace caused due to stray dogs, monkeys, and pigeons. It's criminal that man's best friend has been reduced to being calling a menace. And what is common among these three uh, categories is feeding by humans. I'd like to share with you how and why this has happened. Uh, I'm here today because I'm an animal lover and my role model, renowned classical dancer Rukmini Devi Arundale, she had drafted the Prevention of Cruelty Towards Animals Act in 1960. This act primarily focuses on animal welfare. It doesn't confer rights on animals, but it ensures their protection by preventing unnecessary pain and suffering. It already recognizes the suffering of homeless animals and mandates their human euthanasia or sheltering. As per PCA, the Animal Welfare Board was to be constituted to support this act and its implementation. However, you'll be surprised to know how the Animal Welfare Board, by forming the ABC rules, has contradicted its own parent act. The PCA Act says AB Animal Welfare Board should create shelters, but ABC rules state that the animals should live on the streets. This is evident in the fact that they are asking people to feed dogs everywhere, on the roads, on footpaths, the gardens, inside gated premises. When the dogs are fed, they become territorial about a place and often they attack several people who pass by the territory. Funnily, they have advised that feeders should fix a time and feed during that time. The territorial nature of dogs is not time bound. If a dog forms a territory where he gets food in the night, he is possessive about that place even during the day. The only activity that had kept stray dogs busy was searching for food. The feeders have taken away this activity from them by providing food. Now the dogs get ready-made food and since they have to expend all the energy they have, they do as per their basic nature that is chase and attack moving vehicles, early morning joggers, late night workers, children, etc. For stray dogs, chasing and hunting, rather for all dogs, chasing and hunting is a fun game. They don't chase people to eat them. So the statement that hungry dogs will bite is not true. Hungry dogs will search for food. If this was true, pet dogs would never bite. Pet dogs are kept on leash when they are taken out. They are well fed and they are most often sterilized and vaccinated. So sterilization and vaccination has no bearing on the dog biting. So this is one important point that we have to think, assuming that hungry dogs will bite. It's absolutely wrong. Also feeding by humans makes the dog healthier and more successful in mating, thereby increasing the population. When a dog has to search for food, they don't have the energy to hunt for their opposite gender to mate. When they wake up, they have to again move to find the next meal. But today they are being fed and this has made them reproduce at an alarming rate. AWBI themselves have said availability of edible waste causes increase in population. Then why are they asking citizens to feed dogs? The dog doesn't know the difference between food lying in the dustbin and food given by a person. So the effect of edible waste is same as the food given by the feeder. If at all the dog has to be fed, it should only be in shelters where they are taken care of, not in public places or private places. I have experienced the horrible effects of stray dog feeding in a gated society. A few ladies in my society have been feeding stray dogs in the car parking of their buildings, which has flats owned by many other residents too. So the dogs remain in the car parking. This has resulted in several unprovoked attacks and bites by these dogs on the residents. We created two wonderful green areas just outside the society to feed and maintain stray dogs there. Our aim was that once the dog gets used to feeding in these demarcated areas, they can remain there and that would work like a shelter for them, something like a small mini shelter. But the feeders put a writ petition in the High Court asking for seven feeding areas inside the society. Since there was no law which allowed this, none of their prayers were accepted in the High Court as well as the Supreme Court. By then, Animal Welfare Board made a new set of rules called ABC 2023, which is worse than ABC 2001. In ABC 2023, they have forced the responsibility of stray dogs on citizens, particularly on those living in communities. 
they created a new entity called community dogs and the, said the whole community owns these dogs and feeders have no responsibility this is the most absurd thing that could have happened calling stray dogs as community dogs also does not change the fact that they are homeless and still suffer from accidents diseases and lack of shelter and who is responsible if the dog bites are residents of the community responsible if they are called community dog owners or is the local municipal corporation responsible or is awbi responsible it turns out that nobody is responsible stray dogs that have even killed a child inside a gated society and taken out its intestine cruelly continue to be kept and fed inside the same society this is the reality of india and abc rules article 21 is already suspended for us on public roads and footpaths because they are all occupied by stray dogs now now they have legalized the maintenance of stray dogs in communities stray dog feeding in my community has resulted in more than 75 unprovoked attacks in approximately one and a half years this, there exists a huge nexus of feeders ngos and awbi itself to give an example the local municipal corporation had caught about six stray dogs from a society after receiving complaints of stray dog bites and kept them for observation in a demarcated area the dog feeders released the dogs within 24 hours and we were given a fake report from an ngo called in defense of animals which said that they had observed the dogs for seven days and that the dogs were healthy and fit to be released here not only have they lied but it is ridiculous that biting dogs are to be released on the basis of their health they were never caught in the first place for being unhealthy what will you observe when you confine a dog whom do you expect it to bite when there is nobody around in that confine confinement this is the kind of fraud being done by the guidelines of awbi and by ngos to support the maintenance of stray dogs inside a gated society feeders and ngos also harass and threaten citizens and residents by filing fake cases against them this is the harassment that we face in this country harassment of living in fear of stray dog attacks and bites harassment by feeders via fake cases harassment by interference of ngos and harassment by awbi themselves who has sent us threatening letters asking us to allow stray dogs feeding inside the society i personally have about 20 sections of ipc filed against me including apparently for kidnapping molesting assaulting feeders this is why today we are have experiencing man dog conflict at its peak people see only dogs as a menace both people and dogs suffer and the only beneficiaries are NGOs that get funds for ABC surgeries and shelters, which itself has no bearing on dog attacks. Whole generation of children is growing up scared and traumatized by stray dogs thanks to the ABC rules. I will end by requesting genuine dog lovers to speak up and get the ABC rules repealed and not allow peoples and dogs to suffer. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I can see in the, you know, the question answer uh, box. There were uh, a few questions uh, uh, from uh, community um, projects and and uh, gated societies, which were relevant for uh, you know everything that you said just now. Uh, can I uh, uh, you know get to the questions? And there is one question by uh, Gargi Watts. Uh, she wants to ask uh, Dr. Abhi uh, about any environmental factors also that cause a uh, spread like the map that you have shown. Uh, that's what she's referring to. Uh, the map, she says, shows more cases in Uttarakhand and Chhattisgarh. So is there is there a specific reason for these high cases in the two states? Dr. Vana. I, um, you know, I would take most of these data with a bit of a, with a, bit of a pinch of salt, um, mainly because there's massive underreporting from many states. Um, there's also a correlation with poor health of, uh, services availability in those places. So most, in most cases, humans uh, who have been exposed to rabid dogs um, are unable to obtain uh, post-exposure profile access in time. So it's, there's probably no correlation between the number of dog bites and the number of rabies cases reported in, in, a, in, a, particular, uh, in a particular state or particular region. Uh, like I showed you, you know, Pune has a lot of rabid dogs, but very few rabies cases. Most of the rabies cases that get reported to Pune come from the surrounding villages. Now, rabies is a problem in rural areas where the healthcare services um, are poorer. People don't have access to post-exposure profile access, you know, the vaccinations. So it's not just the vaccinations. You need to also get something called uh, rabies immunoglobulin, which is given to you the first time you, you get bitten. Uh, also, rabies injections have to, have to be taken multiple times. And people, you know, especially from poor, poor rural communities, don't have time to go again and again to go and get these, you know, travel to the nearest city to get these, uh, get these inje injections. 
There's also a lot of um, um, traditional medicine used in many of these places, which does not obviously does not help with, with prevention of rabies. So there's a whole bunch of factors here. I wouldn't necessarily say that there are some environmental um, issues here that are that are reflected on that map. Rather, it could be a problem of access to uh, access to post-exposure prophylaxis. Right. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Vanak. Uh, we don't really have very much time left with us, but uh, can I uh, ask uh, Richard or any of the down to earth uh, team members? And I can see Sunita Ji, Sunita Narayan is also uh, on the on the screen with us. Uh, hi. Um, and uh, if any of you have anything to say or any questions for our uh, reviewer panelists, please go ahead. Richard? Sunita Ji, you mute. Pe you can unmute yourself. Richard, would you like to go before me and then I can... No, I, I don't have any questions. The story answers most of the questions that we raised. And uh, so over to you, Sunita Ji. So, you know, uh, I have to say uh, with some disappointment, uh, uh, Shuparno, that yeah. I have been really hurt uh, by the nature of the discourse that I have seen on this issue that we have raised. Um, we talk about tolerance, we talk about the need for a dialogue, we talk about the need for this, for finding solutions. And it is not about what is the problem and what needs to be done, but it is about the kind of way that the, it is like an attack of um, on anyone who dares to ask a question. Now, um, in CSE's experience, this is exactly what has happened to us when we raised the issue of pesticides. Um, we were told we have a numerous number of slap cases against us today. Slap is strategic lawsuits against public participation because we raised the issue of uh, pesticides and the impact of pesticides on our bodies, on our environment. Obviously, the pesticide manufacturers find that a very inconvenient conversation. And the only way that they can deal with it is to attack the messenger. And that's really what we have seen. And we are continuing to deal with it. Uh, just last week, we have got another legal notice because we have dared to write a story on pollution in a particular industrial area in a state in India. Now, uh, the, it is, nobody is contesting the fact that there is pollution there. The, uh, the legal notice is, how dare you write about this? And there is a threat that we will be taken to court and there are court cases against us. Now, when we did this story, and we did this as uh, down to earth to write about what was clearly an issue that was which is in, in our midst. Um, it is not something that we have imagined. It is an issue that is very much there. Um, Rajat will remember a few years ago, we had done a similar story looking at a wildlife human conflicts, okay? Which is also a very serious issue where you are getting huge impacts on farmers and on others because of wildlife uh, uh, going into the fields. And obviously the issue there also is, what do we do? Now there is no doubt there is an issue about habitat shrinking. There is an issue about the growth of animals, uh, lack of space for them, and about encroachment of humans on their habitats. But it is also an issue that it is adding to conflict and it is adding to uh, problems for farmers. It is adding to problems of, of of uh, tensions between animals and people. And we basically believe that that tension, that conflict is not good, that we need to resolve it. Now to resolve it, we need to discuss it. To discuss it, we need to have the courage. And I'm really talking about courage because quite honestly, after this rabid, absolutely, and I'm sorry, it's a bad word to use in this context, but the rabid debate that I have seen, which is 
imputing every motive on us, which is talking about killing human beings, which is talking about, you know, in, in the worst language possible. I, I don't use this language. I'm a person who believes that social media is to be used very carefully and to be used so that we can actually have a discussion. And I do not subscribe. That is why I refuse to engage with anybody who uses this kind of language and this kind of tone, this kind of tenor. But I have to just use this forum to say how deeply disappointed I am that this is the nature of the discussion that this has brought in. One of the acquisitions against us in social media that I saw was why don't you have people speaking in the webinar who are so-called pro-dogs, pro-monkeys, pro-pigeons, as if any one of us are against them, okay? Firstly, if you read the story, every effort has been made to make put different point of views there. We approached everybody for them to come on to the webinar. If we do not get people to accept to be on the webinar, that is not something that should force us to cancel events. We are now getting to a point where in our own community, we will start saying, why should we write about this? But I can tell you as somebody who's worked, who isn't in, who has some experience in this field of environment, whether you can abuse me, you can denigrate me, you can say whatever you want about us. I can say that with some experience, I'm humbly putting it across to all the people who, who say that they are the ones who are against us because I refuse to be called a not a dog lover. I refuse to be called an animal hater, okay? I would only say to them humbly that if you don't look at this issue in the face and you are not prepared to talk about it, it will only get worse. And the consequences of this will only get much worse for the animals that you are today trying to protect. So let us be very clear about this. This is a discussion that we need to have. We need it as a society. And if we talk about intolerance in the pesticide industry or in other sectors of our society, I am, I am shocked to see the intolerance that I have seen, which is within what I consider my own community. I am sad to say this, that my own community today has become um, an intolerant community where we cannot even discuss, which we think are inconvenient issues. It is an inconvenient issue. It is a tough issue. There are no rights, there are no wrongs. But if we don't discuss it, we will not at least, we'll not be able to have a dialogue. And frankly, the nature of the absolutely virulent, disgusting um, comments that I have seen, I'm not going to engage with them. I'm only going to wish all those people well and just say to them that I am only very sad to see that this is what they will deteriorate to. We will not join them by deteriorating to their level. I hope Shuparno that is, that is not saying too much. No, I think you are quite right. And uh, I do think that uh, we have not joined issue with them. Uh, our panelists also have been fairly, uh, you know, uh, uh, proactive and can sort of maintain the line and length, so to speak. Uh, we have crossed the time span by almost 13 to 14 minutes. So I would like to now, um, you know, say thank you. And Richard, do you have to add something to this? I think the conclusion was made by Sunita ji. Nevertheless, it shows how big this is an issue. issue itself is, yeah. It took a magazine like down to earth to put it on the cover and to get this speaker, the experts on black and white and the kind of debate we are having it. Yes, I think it's not an expect, very expected debate and all these things, but it is a serious issue. As Sunita ji pointed out, I think if you don't discuss and all these things and you don't have it, it's ultimately will go against the species that we are depending. So, right. That's all. And thank you very much for joining us and uh, giving your things really enlightened on these issues, not only just doing the story. And, but And Richard, I think we should continue to have courage to keep saying issues, 
but making but sure as you did in the magazine that all points of view are reflected which is always yeah. our our effort because if you do not have every point of view there you can never have a dialogue and that is what we very strongly believe in not dissent but dialogue but yeah. i am really sad that on the webinar we were not able to have many of the faces that we would like to have had maybe next time but definitely we will continue however difficult it is i have to say there have been points in this last few days in the kind of absolute um, trash that i have seen on social media for me to end up saying let's forget such issues just let's forget them but we won't just as we will not stop writing about pesticides and pollution we will continue to raise issues and try and bring a dialogue and a discussion so that we can move it forward thank you richard thank you rajat thank you himanshu and of course thank you abhi and priya sindhu and vinita and shuparno for putting this together thank you thank you so much thank, thank you all the speakers really really nice of you to have thank you, thank you so much have a thank good day. you